Okay. And here we are live on the Metal Voice. Um, you know, I'm going to preface this. You know, when 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 Steve Grimmett, he passed away, you know, uh, now it's been, has it been a week? Uh, mm. Less than a week. You know, I sent the link to Millie and Millie, you know, she she loved all the all the sort of the fan reaction from it. And she goes, you know, I'm, I need, I need to distract myself. Right. And you just felt like you, there's things you had to say. Right. So that's why you're on, you know, just to, uh, I guess your way of grieving and letting it go, letting it out. And um, we really appreciate, appreciate you being on Max. I know that you've from a, from the perspective as an artist and a friend and uh, you know, you've known Steve and I thought it'd be fitting that you would be on too. Uh, and we're going to have Todd Latore later on, you know, just to give us his perspective as an influence, as a singer, Steve's influence over the years. Right. Um, Alan, did you want to say anything? No, no. Like we said earlier, uh, our condolences from the whole look, uh, metal community i mean the outpouring of emotion from everybody over the last week has been great and we sent our condolences of course to millie and, and her family so thank you I, I can preface this too i could say that steve you know released three albums with grim reaper see you in hell fear no evil and rock you to hell in the 80s and uh our good friend max norman you know was part of the rock you to hell era they went on tour with the hell on wheels uh, with Armored Saint and Halloween in 1987, which was, you know, a great tour back then. He played in Onslaught with Lion's Heart. And of course, recently, uh, Steve Grimmett's Grim Reaper, where he released two albums. Five years ago, I can't even believe it was five years ago, Steve lost his left, or sorry, his right leg partially above the knee, got amputated in Ecuador uh, in 2017, $14,000 were raised by the fans to make sure you guys were sort of on track because the insurance at the time were not paying. And unfortunately, uh, Steve passed away August the 15th, which is almost a week now at the age of 62. So I guess I'm just going to, to Millie, I just, you know, I, I'll just give you the microphone. I don't know what questions to ask you. I don't want to overstep here. So I know... Uh, yeah, you can ask me anything I like. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you if I don't want to answer it. But I want to first just say to thank you to everybody because the support has just been overwhelming. It really has. The I've lit. I mean, within the first twelve hours of announcing it, I must have had three thousand messages. I think within the first twelve hours, it was very difficult obviously because we we're just trying to get our heads around to what happened and we still are getting our head around up and because Steve we weren't Steve we weren't aware that Steve was ill Steve wasn't aware he was ill um and which I'm pleased about because it meant that he didn't he didn't die worrying or feeling ill or thinking he's going to die any day or any of that he died he was still grieving his brother. He never over got, um, came out, uh, got over the death of his brother, which is nearly four years ago now. He, um, he, Steve and his brother were just, this is middle brother. They were just um, inseparable. They did so much together and built planes together and flew together and stuff. And it, Steve never got over the death of his middle brother at all. But aside from that, he was in a really good place. His mental health was really good. He's halfway through writing an album. Um, he was only, we were only talking to Chris Holmes on Sunday evening to talk about him doing a guest slot on one of the tracks. Um, Steve had so many ideas written down. There's tours that are coming up. His new manager, Eliton, was had loads of stuff coming up. And there's Japan, Australia, New Zealand. All of these were coming up next year. He was supposed to do South America again, November. Um, keep it true in end of September. Lo so much going on and we had plans, but actually inside he was actually quite unwell and we didn't realise, but I'm glad because he, he died. Um, he didn't die worrying. He died happy and he wasn't in pain because he went in his sleep. It was instant. The doctor said it was an instant death and he literally just went to sleep and didn't wake up. And then I just found him is lying in his usual 
place when he needs to have a nap because his diabetes is, was quite bad on and off. So he did kind of have the odd naps throughout the day when he could. And he just had one of his morning naps before going out and he just didn't wake up. So yeah, it's been, yeah, it's been just over a week now. It was last Monday that happened. So it's been, yeah, and it's, I'm still getting my head around it. It's quite tough. It feels like he's on tour at the moment. But especially because uh, there's all the videos and photos that people are sharing and it's almost like oh that was last night's gig so it's i'm still trying to process it all at the moment my son is diabetic and for those of you who don't know you know you have to keep a um a watch on your your um your sugar levels if your sugar is too low you have to have extra sugar right and if your sugar's too high, you need uh, insulin or pills, right, to bring it down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, I mean, it wasn't the diabetes that got him. It was um, it was his heart. He had problems with his heart. He didn't have a heart attack when he died, but um, it was issues with his heart. But it's known with people with diabetes because it's unfortunately it goes hand in hand, and you have to extra look after your heart even more so when you've got an illness like diabetes because you've got a high risk of. Um, blood pressure problems which causes problems with the vessels and heart disease and all sorts so and then there's the life of a rock and roll star in the 80s which is always going to take your toll on <laughs> toll on you later on in life I think I think he he uh the reaper boys enjoyed the 80s very much <laughs> <laughs> well I, he, he was well I mean is he lost a lot of weight at least from the last time we saw him right mm. Mm. He was looking better, you know, he was looking good. I mean, uh, you know. Yeah. It's hard to ask you to figure out a question to ask you, you know, like, I don't want to. Um... It's just like Jimmy was mentioning earlier, we, we had a friend that we've known since we were in high school and uh, same circumstance. So so was there, there was no prior indication of anything being wrong with his heart until that moment. Yeah, I mean, there, there had been warning signs, um, again, connected to the diabetes. Um, but we just weren't aware of how severe, how severe things were. And like I say, I'm pleased. I am pleased because I would have been I wouldn't have left his side and I wouldn't have slept because I would have been so worried and he wouldn't have been able to relax because he would have been worried that he could go any day and and the doctor said actually he lived a lot longer than he probably should have done so we are so there's we, we're kind of looking at lots of positives that we had him longer than perhaps medically we should have done he didn't know what was going on and he didn't know he was ill and he died a completely pain-free death he always said to me that his ideal death was dying on stage <laughs> which he nearly did in Ecuador. <laughs> like every rocker, right? <laughs> well, I said that wouldn't be fair for everybody else who were there, though. But he, but he did say he's never scared. He wasn't scared of dying. It was just how he would die. And in an ideal world, he would just want to go to sleep and not wake up. And that's what he did. Was there an official uh, reason that the doctors, have they figured that out yet? They just said it was due to some heart issues. Is that it? They've given, I can't know what the technical terms are, I can't know what the death certificate says, but it's um, it's to do with heart disease, basically. But it's some technical term. <laughs> I can't yeah, remember yeah, what it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it wasn't, it's not a heart attack. He didn't have a heart attack. And Excellent. it wasn't COVID related. And it, like, I've had many messages from people asking me, was it COVID related? And did the vaccine kill him? And no to both of those. <laughs> Max, when's the last time you saw Steve? Oh, a long, long time ago. I don't remember. Maybe doing that video for um, Rocky, Rocky to Hell. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the last time. I might, might have been the last time. Although I have spoken to him um, since then. I actually spoke to, well, taxied him. Oh, probably only a few months ago, actually. Um, I was doing some... Um, uh, some courseware, some classes on uh, production and stuff like that. And he was saying, oh, I want to, you know, I'd be interested in doing that, you know, but he wanted to pick my brain about a few things, I guess. But 
what a great singer and what a lovely guy. I, I, I mean, it's, it's really shocking to me. I, it's just straight out of the blue. I, I feel like I felt when Nick Menzer died, it's just like all of a sudden. And, and uh, it, it's a very shocking thing. And, I, you know, it's difficult to take, really. Uh, you know, and you always wonder if, you know, I always, you always wonder what could have been, like Millie's saying, it feels like he's kind of on tour and, you know, what he could have done. And, Maybe we would have been able to work together in the future. And I don't know, you know, it's just uh, life is such a fleeting thing that you just got to grab hold of it as much as you can. And, and you know, just, you know, look, try and look after yourself and try and, uh, you know, love your brother and all the rest of it, really, because it, it's, it's here and gone in a flash, I guess. Mm -hmm. I should also mention in the video link, I put the uh, the fundraiser that your friend Millie um, yes. started for you. And I think it's important, you know, because people don't realize that it's not like when you're a rock and roller, right? You're not getting these uh, benefits that you do when you work for a global corporation. There's no mm -hmm. insurance, you know, there's nothing, right? And uh, so no. the link is there. If you want to help out with, you know, to send off Steve, you know, the way he should be sent off, you know, the link is there. If you want to donate, please donate. Uh, it's again, it's in the video description. Do not send the money to me, <laughs> please just put it in the video <laughs> description. You know, one time somebody was sending me money. No, don't send it to me. I don't want the money. You send it right to them and, and to that uh, GoFundMe. And, um, it's there to make sure Steve. So what do you have in terms of, uh, arrangements? Maybe you want to talk about funeral arrangements. You're going to stream this sure. live, yeah, is that so, it? Yeah, um, yes. So um, Steve wasn't born in sort of, so we're in uh, Wiltshire, um, but he didn't come from here. He come from Cheeksbury. And, well, he didn't come from Cheeksbury, but he did a lot of was growing up in Cheeksbury. And um, there's a beautiful abbey there, and that's where his funeral will be. Uh, it's on the 7th of September. Uh, 2 p.m. local time, UK time. It, absolutely, anybody's welcome. You, everybody is is welcome to come. And but we are going to live stream it as well. So I'll share the link close to the time. Um, but yeah, and then there's going to be a wake afterwards. So if anyone who's there in person, more than welcome to come along. Steve always um, it made time for his fans because his fans are incredibly important to him. Because if it wasn't for his fans, he wouldn't have. There would be no Steve Grimmett, you know, it would just be a regular guy in his shed playing with his planes, that would be it. So it wouldn't, you know, there, there'd be no musician, there'd be no, the person that Steve become. So I, I'm, if people are coming along, then I want to meet them afterwards as well and, and, and say thank you to people to, to joining, joining in. So, but yeah, I'm very grateful to everybody that, that's um, donated and I'm very grateful to my friend Rachel as well to, to start up the fund. I didn't ask her to do it. That was nothing to do with me at all. But she just, I was talking to her and I think only a few days before saying to her how much it's going to cost, which a funeral is almost the cost of a wedding. It's a huge amount of money. And um, and Steve was never shy to admit that he didn't have any money and he was on benefits because he never saw any of the Reaper money. So he's, um, yeah, we're not, he had, he had the fame and he had the, you know, rock and roll, background but he never had the never had the money that come with it we don't live in a mansion like people think we do we're in a, a very modest rented accommodation <laughs> so yeah and yeah i'd say everyone's everyone's welcome to come along and you'll be streaming it on uh is it going to be on youtube or facebook how are people i don't know yet i don't know yet how they're going to do it um we might do it through we might do both I need to speak to the Abbey to see how they do it, but yeah, maybe we'll do both through our through the uh, Reaper channel and also through the Facebook page, the Grim Reaper Facebook page. I'll tell you a quick mm -hmm. little story. Steve was a funny guy. Steve was had a great sense of humor, and uh, the last time he was in Montreal, every time he comes to Montreal, we'll go interview him and see him and hang out. Right, the last time he was in Montreal, I see him. Hey, Steve, how you doing? Good, good. We talk. He goes, okay, I'll be back in a minute. And he comes back and he's wearing his metal voice shirt. You know, he brought it all the way from the UK to wear it just so I could, just for the interview. 
Like that, Steve, you know, like it just, it just surprised me. You know, and you think about it, you know, you're going on tour. The last thing you think about is packing clothes for somebody. But he thought of me, you know, like he thought of me and Alan. He thought of us, you know, sort of representing, you know, and, uh, you know, it was it's, it's kind of like funny and touching at the same time. Right. That somebody could think of you that much to, uh, you know, go out of his way. So I like he loved his that. T-shirts. He's got a ridiculous amount of T-shirts. I don't know what I'm going to do with them all. I'm going to have to, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> Store them some, I was never allowed to get rid of t-shirts. I always tried to remove some of them and he wouldn't let me because he said, no, every single one means something. It's been given to him by a band or a company or he bought it when he was in a certain place. So yeah, I'm going to have to keep them forever, I think. <laughs> <laughs> he used to, when he used to come to Montreal, he just, you know, and, and I go, okay, Steve, I'll, I'll see you later. He goes, no, where you going? And he just like make me sort of sit there and we talk like all the way to showtime. And then he just go perform. It's like, <laughs> what a guy, like, you know, and, 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 you know, uh, he was funny. He was a funny guy. He was, he was really funny and interesting to talk to. And, uh, you know, I always enjoyed it when he came and I was looking forward to seeing, you know, me and Alan want to see him again, you know, on tour. We always like to go out and see him, you know, and, uh, I don't know. Um, yeah. Max, like funny. They say you that sometimes the real Steve when you when you're interviewing and he's on stage, that's the true Steve because he was that's when he was at his happiest because he absolutely lived for being on stage. And they say they say sometimes you don't want to meet your heroes, but Steve was definitely the exception to that. I mean, he was a such a great guy to meet and always had time for everybody, and and of course uh, comes alive on stage as as you said. So mm. yeah. Yeah. Max, do you have any cool stories back in the fear no evil days? How did you record those vocals? How did you record those vocals of Steve? Those are like phenomenal. Uh, well, you know, he's a really good in the studio and, and he's a very, he lasts a long time. He can sing for a long time. He's, he's got good voice control. So um, uh, he's a, it was always a pleasure to work with. So uh, uh, that album was recorded at Longview Farm up in Massachusetts. And uh, um, he Rock would sing, yeah. yeah, he would, uh, he would sing, uh, I think we would start probably about five, six o'clock in the evening. He would sing, uh, he'd be able to do a good six hours every night. Oh. So uh, it was pretty, it was pretty good. And he, he, we'd be, we'd bounce around and we'd pick stuff up and then we'd go back and check other stuff. And, uh, he was a real hard worker and uh, only interested in getting the best possible result, of course. And, uh, and uh, you know, a, a great singer. I mean, and, and still, I, I heard some stuff recently and can still sing really great or could still sing really great. So, you know, it's a, it's a big loss to the, to the singers, to the rock singing world, you know. It's a big loss. The guy was a really good singer. And, uh, wasn't that hard to get those vocals? In fact, it was it was it was very enjoyable. It was good to do sessions with. He's a happy. He was a happy guy, and he you know he always had a good time and enjoyed himself. As Milly said, he was he was always enjoying himself. So you know, um, uh, pretty easy, pretty easy to get great results. You know, the album speaks for itself. You know, he sings really well on that record. He sings really well on pretty much everything I've heard. So you know. <laughs> That's uh, true. It's unfortunate that you know, you know, didn't really get recognised for the for how good he was. You know, and it was really up there amongst one of the one of the world class singers. And you know, I, I don't think ever was recognised. And actually, um, a friend of mine only just recently heard a couple of Grim Reaper albums, and they said to me, "Well, how the fuck did I not hear this before?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, I don't ask me. That's your problem. You know. I said, it's Steve Grimmett. I said, the guy's a great singer. I said, I'm surprised you never heard it. This, this is a person that was, knows a lot about metal and everything like that, but, but, but for some reason. So I don't know what happened, and I don't know why uh, Steve wasn't more widely known, but obviously he was more widely known than I thought because now people are coming out and saying, you know, but it seems to be, it's a bit of a shame that it takes Steve's passing away to, for people to, you know, uh, come out of the woodwork and say how great he was. But, you know, he really was a great singer. And uh, it's a huge loss. It's a huge loss to everybody, you know, to all of us. I think, I think the comments...
we've seen over the last week is a lot of people are going back and rediscovering Steve through through the work of Grim Reaper and his other bands. So that's that's a positive as well. So yeah, I mean, you know, that people go listen and they go, hey, this guy's really fucking good. Yeah. You know, like 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 somebody thought he wasn't. I don't understand, you know, but there's a lot of people that a lot of people. So in in a, in, in one sense, there's some good may come out of this that, that may he may start to get the recognition that he, he didn't get, you know, so let's hope. You just Rock. sparked the me- you, you sparked a little memory for me. I remember I love turning guys on to different types of bands back in the 80s. And I remember a guy I worked with, he dropped by, I said, you got to listen to this. And I put on the Grim Reaper. I actually put on that your album, Max, that you produced here. And uh, he just could not believe. He never heard, like you said, never heard of these guys. And I put it on. He's like, you, you know, I got to get a copy of this tomorrow. You know, I got to run out and buy this. He was just completely blown away by that album. So, Million. yeah, he, you know, yeah, but uh, you know, he did a lot of. And I, I, I'm not familiar with everything that he did either. Millie can probably fill us in a bit more on that. But I, I, I know he did like two or three other bands and and uh, that i never that i actually never heard so uh hopefully we can we can find out who that is and we can uh you know we take a listen to some of the other stuff i mean there's there's i think there's quite a bit of stuff out there that i i've never heard certainly mm. yeah really, he's, what, he's, he's done tell us about the the the, la- the latest there was a live album that was just released correct steve grim at grim reaper live album was that yeah I don't know a lot about it, I'll be honest. But yeah, okay. it's I can't remember where it was recorded, but um, it's been on the back burner for, well, not even on the back burner, but it's just been sat there for so long. And it was recorded a number of years ago. And they've been meaning to do something with it for ages. And then, um, yeah, they just sort of just managed to, to do it and the label. So Steve's actually, he started up his own label. It's called um, Reaper Records. So, um, the so the so the vinyls so the the three albums the three the first Reaper albums have been released on vinyl, on Reaper Records and then any re-releases is going to be done on Reaper Records. So I don't know anything about owning a label, but I will do my best to try and keep it going uh, along with um, the other label that Steve signed to. So yeah, he did loads and um, he did Grimstein with a good friend of ours, Steve Stein in America, which is why it's called Grimstein. Um, that's kind of quite a bit more melodic stuff. There's a bit of a bit, a bit heavier in there as well, but that's really lovely. They were planning on, again, for years, they'd been planning on doing a second Grimstein album. There might be enough written. I don't know if there's enough written there already. There was his solo one, Personal Crisis, which I think Steve Fearless is, was his proudest piece of work. He absolutely loved it, loved that album, That's but was really surprised album. he didn't do enough. He didn't do well, as well as he was expecting. But I think it was the label that had it at the time. It was a German label, and I can't remember what it's called, and they didn't really push it hard enough. So I think all these things will be re-released over time. I need to have a chat with Steve's other label and um, the co-owner of his Reaper Records as well. And yeah, get, get them all out of the woodworks. Lions, of course, the Lion's Heart stuff came out on, uh, I don't know what you call it, lots of CDs that packed together. And yeah, we were working through the whole back catalogue as much as we possibly could, but we just ran out of time to do it while Steve was still alive. But we're, we're working on it. He's done a lot of guest slots. He's done a lot. Of, he's done so much. There's just, we'd be here for hours if I listed everything. <laughs> <laughs> this sh- just so you know, I've been wearing this shirt for not every day, every second of the day, but every time we do a show, I've been wearing it as a for this past week. And everybody keeps asking me, where did you get this shirt? You know, where'd you get this shirt? It's very, very popular. It's a nice shirt. It was actually done by the guys in Montreal when he was in Canada mm-hmm. on the Canadian tour. So yeah. You know, if you got any of these guys, put them out there. I think you'll get a lot of uh, you know, a lot of people who and even your shirt is nice too. Uh, that's that's a cool show. yeah these are kind of limited edition it's, it's quite basic it's just got it's got, it's got the name on it but um i don't have got any of these left but at the um so steve and the band were supposed to play keep it true in germany oh, yes, at the end yes, of the month yes, from yes. the 30th of september and um so they were headlining the friday night on the 30th and mm. obviously it's not going to happen now but um ollie the one of the organizers said to me look 
how do you feel if we still keep their slot, still bring the band over? Um, but we have guest singers still doing a reset, but we'll have lots of different guest singers, which I thought was a great idea. Yeah. Um, so what they're doing is they, they've printed some pins, just some like little badge pins. So the first, I can't remember how many they've done, a couple of thousand or a few hundred, I can't remember how many it is. So they, people get them for free. So the first time many people turn up will get a pin badge for, in memory of Steve for free. And then they're also selling some unique memory T-shirts as well. But they're only going to be sold there. So if you want one, you need to go. <laughs> so you've got uh, quite a good lineup. It's on their on their Facebook page anyway, the Keep It True Facebook page. And Saxon are headlining Saturday night. Um, I can't remember who's. And then they've got lots of bands playing Sunday as well. So so that would be good. And I'm going. I'm going to go to that. So if anyone's going, then come and say hello. But and Steve's son's coming with me. He's going to sing a couple of songs because he's like his dad. He's got a very good voice. Um, Steve's daughter Sammy has got a beautiful voice as well, but she's not, she's not, she doesn't <laughs> sing, but um, in in public. But Russell definitely got his dad's voice, so yeah, watch this space with his son definitely. <laughs> it's very <laughs> cool. I'm gonna bring Todd Latori in in one minute. Did he ever get around? So okay, the last thing he told us was he was kind of trying to work on a biography, but he just didn't know anything about writing books. So he had to get a friend to help him write a biography. Was anything ever done? No. Uh, no, he kind of wrote the odd bit. He wrote the odd memory down, but in nowhere near enough for a chapter, let alone a whole book. I just, he just wasn't in the right mindset. The problem with once he lost his leg and he had his PTSD, he just, he really struggled, really struggled with yeah. his mental health. And especially then we had, well, then it's like nearly two years later, his brother died and then we had COVID. So we had lockdown. So he just had so many hurdles to overcome. And like I said earlier, he was at his happiest when he's on stage. And so he couldn't sing. He wasn't on stage for two years and he didn't sing for two years. So he wouldn't, he didn't even, we wasn't, many musicians thought, right, I'm going to write a new album. I'm going to write lots of music. I'm stuck in my house. But Steve just couldn't do it. He just couldn't get the drive. This, his mental health really took over. And he just couldn't just couldn't write a book or music, couldn't do anything. And then did did, did COVID really depress him because he couldn't oh, yeah, get on stage terribly. and write? That was really like badly. Really badly. Yeah. He really, really suffered bad. Because the last time he taught properly would have been um 2019 when he did the North US. That would have been the last time he properly toured. And then he's he's done the odd gig. Um, but I would say since lockdown was released in the UK anyway, then he's only done not even a handful of gigs. He did South America, I think it was July this year. He did about four gigs, I think. But that's it. He's just, yeah, it really affected him badly. Okay. Um I'm going to bring on Todd. I know Todd wants to talk about um, Steve as sort of an influence to singers because Todd's, you know, a great singer and, you know, what his experience is. Just hang on, everybody, as I bring Todd on. Okay, I bring Todd on. Todd? Hey there. Hey. Let me uh, let me maximize the screen here so I can see everybody. There's Millie. There's Max. Hey, Todd. Hi. It's been a little bit. Um, oh crap. Hi, Alan. Hey, and, Todd. You know, I I I have a couple things I want to say before we get into the to him as a singer. Um, I I hate to meet Millie in this context because. Um, it, there was some correspondence um, a while back about um, doing a guest spot uh, for something, working with with them and with Steve. And I, I couldn't tell you how sweet and pleasant and kind you were, Millie, to me, because we, we, we hadn't met in person and you were such a sweetheart. And um, there was just this instant um, fondness of you 
and and Steve through you. Um, usually people, you know, would know Steve and then meet you. And it was the other way around for me. So I, on behalf of myself and certainly everyone in Queensryche, we, we send our most sincere condolences to you for a very profound loss. I'm, I'm getting kind of choky. Um, I mean, it's an awful thing that you have to go through. And, you know, we all unfortunately have to face stuff like this. Um, and there's something else I wanted to say before we talk about Steve's incredible voice is a lot of spouses um, of people in the industry that are in the spotlight um, sometimes tend to feel that they're in the shadow of their partner and there can, sometimes that's a problem, you know, clearly you have your own identity, you're your own person, you're, you know, you, you don't want to be just Steve's wife, right? Like you're, you're Millie, you have your own thing, but always remember this, you will forever be embraced by one of the best communities of people in the world wherever you go in any context that has to do with rock and heavy metal always know that you know the word family can get loosely thrown around but i mean it from my heart when i tell you that if it's any consolation or if it brings any sliver of comfort in the in the future to know that you you will always be looked at as your own person but but very much valued for being that significant other in his life and being by his side and all of the things that you do for him that we don't even know about. So just always remember that you're, you are loved by a community of people literally all over the world, not just in your community, not in your country, but all throughout South America, I mean, continents. And I want you to know that, you know, I'm sure you're in shock. Like you said, you you feel like he's on tour and I, I'm sure that you're numb to this and it, it maybe hasn't even hit, hit you yet. I don't know. Um, but I just wanted to to extend that to you that, you know, like when people are married and then they get divorced and the in-laws were where they were family, right? But then when you get divorced, most of the time you never really hear from the in-laws anymore, right? This is not that case because even though he's gone there, his music lives on forever. Max was a part of something very iconic, you know, as well. Um, and, and the good thing is even though he's gone, you will not fade away it, for us in, in the same way that like Wendy Dio is around and you know your life doesn't have to be um always focused on his legacy you have your legacy too but but just just know that you're very well thought of and respected and i'm sure that there are so many people that look forward to meeting you and sharing wonderful stories that will bring a smile and a tear to your face and and it's you know time will heal but you're not gonna be forgotten because he's gone now. You will always be embraced by this community of people. I just wanted you to know that. Thank, um, you. Thank you. Yeah. So, so I have a, a, a quick story about when I first heard of Grim Reaper. So it was in my, my teenage years, my mid teens. And in Florida we had, um, I mean, there was MTV, but unless you were on headbangers ball you know late at night you didn't really get to see the cool metal bands and of course i watched headbangers ball and all that stuff but we had a local tv station called v32 kind of a a lower budget thing but it was an awesome an awesome uh tv station that played just metal <laughs> and i remember i was in my bedroom and i was a drummer back then i liked to sing but i was a drummer and uh, 
We've seen the pictures, Todd. We've seen the pictures. And, <laughs> and, oh, good. <laughs> and, 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 rock, and Rock You to Hell, the video, came on. And I remember this, this head-banging, you know, this good head-banging groove, you know, and it caught my attention. And I turned and I looked and I saw this guy with, you know, the, the classic 80s bangs, which I still think are cool as shit. And, and, <laughs> and he had this, this insane long hair and he was just like, he was so like metal in this video. <laughs> and then his voice, he begins to sing. And I was like, wow. Like I, at that time, I, I, what I really didn't hear vocalists that sounded so natural and and just it sounded effortless and it was such a power it sounded really powerful it was the complete embodiment of what it meant to be like a heavy metal singer he, he had he looked that way he he was saying you know back in those times I would, you know rock, you know rock you to hell it was like if he said hell in a song it was kind of like ooh, <laughs> who are these guys you know, but it had that edge to it. And I just, I became captivated. And every time that video would come on, no matter what I was doing, I would stop and I would watch the whole thing. Fast forward, um, you know, two decades. And I'm now in a band called Crimson Glory. And I'm just, you know, I always like to sing, but I was never in a band as a singer. I was always like a, a rock metal drummer. And I really gained an even more newfound respect for his ability because as singers, um, you know, men have a chest voice and a, a mixed voice and a head voice and all these different things. But you really want the voice to sound like one voice. And the way that he could transition from like a chest belt up into this really high register without sounding thin, but sounding very robust and full, it was like, okay, there's a handful of guys in the world that can not only just do it, but I mean, sell it. And, and he really made it look and sound effortless. And, and unless you do that, you really can't understand what it takes to be able to to pull that off and to do it. I think he was just a born natural, just a natural talent for, for singing. Um, and so he was very inspirational uh, in those formative years of me, like getting into to heavy metal, going from like rock, but more into metal. And it was like, this guy is kind of the epitome of of having that full voice without sounding really thin and and um having sound sounding like two different voices within somebody but rather one full complete voice and and he was very much just so respected you know and as we age you know our our voices change and you can't do what you, you can't do when you're in your 50s like you're in your 20s and um but you know when he performed still and I watched I would continue to keep tabs and watch videos even after the amputation and he was out there and if that's not a testament I mean we have bands I'm not going to name names there are bands out there touring that are only doing it for the cash they hate each other and they're making <laughs> the, they're making the big the big bucks right like Matt millions they're they're multi-millionaires they're grossing insane numbers. They're netting insane numbers. And for someone like Steve, and it's it's the 99% of every other heavy metal band, you're doing it for the passion of it. So for a, for a guy that lost that leg, who's not making millions of dollars for, you know, sharing his craft and his heart and his talent with, with an audience, to me, that is that's richer than any band that hates each other, that doesn't want to be on stage doing it for multi millions of dollars. And my hats off to to him for continuing to do that passion and connecting with an audience. People just people just wanted to see him in person, you know, like wow, this is the guy. This is him. And 
And what a cool thing to experience and for you to witness and, and for him to, to take in that love from people that just like me, I was that 15 year old, 14, 15, 16 through watching this guy on my TV. And now I, there's a possibility I could do a collaboration on, on, on a well-known song, you know, that he did, or I got to meet Max Norman because of, because of this affiliation and Max and I have met in person before and communicated here and there. And I mean, it's, it's been an honor for me, even though I'm, I'm doing it now, but I didn't get into that for like on this level till my late thirties, I had a whole nother career and business before all of that. So I just think it's really awesome that somebody like Steve um, was still, despite those setbacks, whether it was emotional setbacks from losing a leg. I mean, I can't even imagine that, but going out there and just giving it his all every, every single night and still having plans and what not. And, and I, I was listening to the interview earlier and you mentioned the Keep It True Festival. And I know Oliver very well. And he actually messaged me. It was today or yesterday. My days are getting mixed up, but he asked if I would be willing to be one of the guest singers at that festival and that they would fly me out to do it. Unfortunately, I'm on tour um, for pretty much all of September and I, I can't be there, but I did thank him privately for thinking of me and um, asking me to be part of it. I'll certainly be there in, in spirit. And um Crimson Glory did the same thing when their original singer Midnight passed away um, and they did a memorial concert and they had like 17 guest singers. They did, a, it was a big headline set um, at the Prague Power Show in, in Atlanta, Georgia. And it was very therapeutic, I think, for the band. It was, I mean, it was hard that some of the guys were crying, you know, and it's during like to start a song like the drummer was wiping, you know, people are, it's very emotional. Um, but I think it was a, a very, it was part of a healing process and kind of sharing that love of, of the music and who he was as a person. And I, I, I think it's really great that Oliver's going to keep the band on, on that bill and just get everybody that can come up and, and, I think it's know, great. I think it's a wonderful I tribute. I thought it was amazing. You know? Yeah, it's, Mill- it's, it's really great. M- Millie, explain to everybody how difficult it was for Steve and what courage it took to get up on stage and to tour on one leg. And I mean, I've seen this in action. I've seen Steve, you know, in action. In New York, uh, good old Kenny had to, like, help him get somebody to help fix his little the, the little that sort of wheelchair thing that he had, right? Explain to everybody what it took for him to do this. It was really, really tough. And there's not many countries that are suitable for wheelchairs, especially South America, places. Ecuador is probably one of the worst, actually. And if you think about the rainfall that they have, so the the, um, pavements are so deep, because of all the water, but they're also slanted. So when you're trying to go along there in a wheelchair, it's virtually impossible and there's no drop curbs. So I couldn't even get him back up onto the onto the pavement. It's just a nightmare and venues, very few venues are wheelchair accessible. There's, um, what was it? I think it was, we. Um, not that long ago, actually. I think it was just at the weekend we were watching a show that was um, filmed at the Whiskey. Um, and there's, I think it was the Whiskey, and there's steps, steep steps going onto the stage that you've got to go down. And Steve was like, yeah, that was it. And it's just, it's just not suitable for people in wheelchairs. But you don't, and you don't think about it until you're in that situation and they say that you actually when you lose a limb um, and you're especially in a wheelchair or if you're walking on a prosthetic which Steve did at times but it's very tiring and very painful it can be very painful Um, it takes 80% more energy to be able to just walk and if you think that so 
initially he so he had three operations before he lost the pretty much the whole leg he had the lost the foot then below knee and then it went above knee if he hadn't have got an infection when he just when they cut just below the knee it would have been a lot easier because you still got your knee joint to kind of kick out your leg to be able to walk and it would have been like walking normally but because he didn't have his knee joint that leg his right leg he was having to walk with his hip so his leg that he had he's walking normally but then the other leg you're trying to swing your hip to try and walk and it was just really really tiring for him plus having the diabetes and stuff he just and the the blood flow in his good leg wasn't great at the time either so he had to have extra he had to put stents have stents put in to open up the blood vessels to to encourage a bit more flow to go through of the blood it was really tough i mean even here it's it's been quite tough he, he couldn't get upstairs for a for a year until they put a stair lift in until we managed to get a stair lift in and we don't have a bathroom downstairs. <laughs> I had a, a, a very dear friend of mine um, that had a condition called uh, NF2. Um, but he ended up having an amputee. He was a very dear friend of mine. I used to meet him at the mall because the bus would bring him and people from the living facility he was in. And I'd have to feed him. Um, and he just became basically um, like a quadriplegic. Um, but when he lost his, his one leg, I remember him explaining phantom pain to me. Yeah. Okay. And he felt like his foot, his leg was there and he would try to itch it too. Like he would reach down to scratch his foot. There's no leg. There's nothing there to scratch. Right. But the pain, he would have the pain, but the, the, the brain was still, he still felt like if he wasn't fully awake and he woke up, he felt like because there was the sensation of the leg still being there, that he would go to take a step. There was a couple of times where he went to take a step and of course he fell yeah. flat on the ground. And mm -hmm. I imagine that- Steve did fall many times. Probably, probably thought not- On stage not because, actually. But I mean, not because like I lost my balance knowingly, but like, I, I felt like I could walk because mm -hmm. I feel like I have two legs yeah. and I'm sure that that you probably, he probably experienced that too, which there's. He did. Yeah. Even up yeah. and I mean, it's been five and a half years and even up to the day he died, he, he would always get phantom pains. He had to drive him mad. And you say it'd be really, really painful. And like, if you've got cramp or something in your leg, you stand up and you try and stretch it and move around. He couldn't do that because it wasn't, physically wasn't there it was just the brain and so, you just can't doesn't you can't really do anything about it they try and put you on medication to try and numb the um, nerves and so they just it just wasn't working for him so he just wow. had to put up with it so that lasted yeah. for for years the it, whole yeah, time. he always had it yeah always had it but, but yeah, several times he got up split second forgetting he didn't have two legs and just <laughs> keeled over yeah. yeah he did it on stage i remember him ringing me after doing a gig i can't remember where he was i think it was in north america somewhere and he phoned me and said i've fallen because he always his biggest fear was falling over when he was on stage mm. but he and he did and he phoned me after a gig and said i fell over on stage unfortunately all the fans caught me because he'd literally fallen over to the on the over the edge of the stage <laughs> and wow. the fans all reacted in time to catch him Push him back up again. And he's and a he big got, guy too. That's, that's the thing, He is right? a big guy, yeah. You, you know, up and, uh, oh, and then he carried on. <laughs> you know, what? something else uh, is, is like as a singer, right? Um, like when you're a drummer, you have your drums as kind of your blanket, right? When you're a guitar player, it's kind of like this shield in front of you. You can throw your head around. You can, you can do things, right? Maybe if your voice as a singer, if your voice isn't so great at that day or you're you're feeling a little off, you can you can hold the microphone and you can pull it away. You can <clears throat> you can <clears throat> I do it all the time. You something's in your you just feel like you need to spit something out or cough, or you can use mic control. You can lean into a note and then when you feel secure in it, you can then kind of lean into the mic. Steve didn't have that. He had a headset. Yeah. So talk about even more vulnerability and courage 
to get on stage when you can't pull away from the mic when you're starting to crack up or you're you're not, you know, we can use that to our advantage when we're not doing so well in a live situation. Steve had the that exposed. Yeah, he had that exposed. Well, exposed. He, had, he would I seen him with like a cane and then he mm -hmm. had the I don't know if it would be called it wasn't a prosthetic. It was um I don't know. Hydraulic of some sort. Okay, yeah. whatever that is. So he had that apparatus on his leg and then he had a cane and then of course you know oh he's trying to connect with his audience which he was but i he but he had this headset and you're thinking and i looked at him and i went god damn this guy is really putting it all out there that's it people don't realize you know that that vulnerability and and when you're you know when you're the singer you're like front and center right and everybody's looking at you and there's there are insecurities that we that we all have as people and when you're on stage and then when you're the singer and then your voice is your actual instrument that you can't just tune up really quickly i really give him so much um you know i don't know what the right word is kudos Prop, I guess. <laughs> yeah, kudos yeah, is the him, right word <laughs> i give him props for for just fucking going balls out and putting it out there and just doing it man and doing it with a smile the guy you know i never saw him throwing tantrums on stage or i mean the guy was just looked like a kid in a candy store to be there with the audience and perform these songs and, and what a great memory for for an audience to have and at the end of the day that's what you're remembered for right it's not oh this guy was so what an amazing guitar player and he was this and he was that but he was a jerk you say, wow, this guy not only had an incredible voice, but what a, from what I, and again, I wasn't friends with him, but I've seen tons of interviews. I've heard stories from people that really knew him and worked with him and et cetera. I mean, see, guy just seemed like a total teddy bear, sweetheart of a guy. And what a legacy to leave behind that you were remembered as this, this loving, humble person that just, Love, you know, performing for people and creating. You know, I got to, I got to, I got to say this, you know, the last time he was here in Montreal, you know, he, he told me he was suffering or he was suffering from post-traumatic stress and he didn't really give much input on the last album that he did. And you know what? It's to Todd's point here, you know, he just, he didn't show it. He didn't show that he was suffering from depression or you, you just, you know, he was just humorous and he was delightful and he was brave and I, I think brave a brave sounds like a really good word you know like he didn't show brave, it brave. maybe he showed it at home really i don't know like he just he, when he was out on tour he just he just maybe because he was so happy to be on tour and to be with fans and and to you know do what he loves to do i mean you know yeah, he did. I know I said it earlier, but he really did live to be on that stage. If that had been taken away from him, if he, if something had happened to his voice, I think as well, when he lost his leg, then I, he wouldn't have lived as long as he did. He just, he really did live for it. When, when he was lying in bed, because in Ecuador, he was completely bedridden. He was not allowed out of bed for the whole five weeks. When you're here in the UK, the day after having an amputation, they get you out of bed and rehab starts immediately the next day mm -hmm. and he only had 30 minutes um of internet a day because it was just so expensive you, you could you could see it i mean we, we we streamed it we filmed it all live on youtube yeah. and, and, yeah, yeah. and we were there and 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 you were 30 minutes and and let me tell you first of all this is what todd said before you were brave to just you were flying from the uk all the way to ecuador to see him and he was all by himself he didn't understand the language spanish right so he's mm. just in bed by himself and he couldn't communicate with the doctors no. and they're cutting his leg off and they're cutting his, and like you said, three surgeries. So, and then you had to fly him back. Mm. Right. And he had to right. wait until he healed to a certain degree to fly him back. Right. And yeah, both of you, like, it, it's just a movie right there. That's a, you know, that's, that's a, that's a, an incredible story. I mean, uh, yeah. and, yeah, and if anybody wants to see that, that was quite the experience and it's there on YouTube. Please go mm -hmm. see it. You know, it's it's a testament to the bravery of you both and, and, and your you, relationship, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, he spent the whole time because he couldn't do anything else. 
because before I got there, he had nothing. You know, obviously he had no magazine. I took over his laptop. I took a load, a load of movies, like on a hard drive. I took him some magazines. He had nothing, absolutely nothing to do and say so nobody to talk to. And he spent the whole time thinking, right, I can. So he's so there was um, a World War uh, pilot, Douglas Bader, and he had both his legs amputated and literally had poles for legs. And he still was a fighter pilot and he still carried on. And he was saying, right, if Douglas Bader can do that and still fly and still kill the enemies and all that kind of stuff, why can't I get back up on stage? And this was 100 years ago, you know, the technology we've got today. So he lay in bed and he thought, right, what do I love doing? Well, I, I love building and flying my planes. Well, I can do that from a wheelchair, right? Tick, right, cars. Oh, I can get a specially adapted car. But if I, um, so he would, at night, he would visualize himself driving with one foot and automatic. Um, he did have a specially adapted car, but he could drive a normal automatic with the one leg, with his left leg. He's like, right, okay, I could do that. And singing, he's like, well, I'll have to sing sitting down, but we'll give it a go. And he was just so determined. He thought, right, there's nothing I can't do. I've lost a leg, I've not lost my voice. But I think if he'd lost his voice, it would be a whole different story. He would not, he would not have lived much past six months, I don't think. It would have killed him. He just couldn't have coped. Because he just, he he just that, loved, he lived for it. He set that goal right away. I don't know which festival, but he said, I'm going to be singing at that festival. I'm not canceling yeah. that date. I will be there. And the look on his face, I think somebody videotaped it. When he yeah. came out and said, I mission accomplished. I set a goal and and now here I am. So Yeah, it was seven months later. It was, um, oh, I've forgotten where it was. Headbanger, it was in Germany. Open air, open air, headbangers. That was it, yeah. Oh, and yeah. it was, yeah, even his um, team here to to get him like his rehab team and they're like really it's been you really want to get back on stage in july you lost your leg middle of january and this gig's beginning of july that you know this isn't going to happen he's like yeah well it will happen <laughs> and it did and it was i don't think i've ever been so proud of him as i was then it was absolutely amazing and the crowd were awesome and thousands of people there and the, he he was standing up there crying because he was i think he was just so shocked that he was it he was thoroughly exhausted but it was just amazing it really was amazing and they was like right I can do this it's only been seven months I can do this so what, what's holding me back now so he just carried on M Max I again, that, a question. Was the fans. that was the fans that allowed him to do that just a question for Max you know Max looking back even today you know people always talk about the Tates and the Dickinsons and the Halfords and Dio's back in the 80s but I mean, where, where for you, where would Steve fit into that or with, with his voice, his tremendous voice that he had? Well, how do you mean? I, I, don't, I didn't really understand. Like, I mean, I mean you know, everybody, why, why wasn't he considered, you know, why wasn't he as famous as some of the other singers when he had was just as much vocal talent? According to, based, oh, well, based on I, your. <laughs> well, uh, that's one of the biggest mysteries out there, but, you know, um, uh, I'm trying to remember what the label was. Was it uh, was it Atlantic? No, oh, RCA know. for the album you did. Was it? Well, the first three you're talking about. Yeah, well, the one I Ebony. did. Ebony was it RCA. Oh. RCA was it? Yeah. In those days, um, uh, there was a lot of. Uh, in order to sell records and tour, you really needed uh, the support of a record company. You needed tour support. Um, everything in those days was based on uh, touring and getting the record in those, getting the, the album into those towns that the, that the tour would hit. And that was how you sold the records. And because in those days, one of the big things obviously was trying to sell the record, trying to sell the vinyl, trying to sell the CD, whatever it was. So um, uh, possibly there was a lack of tour support for this band and didn't. And, and they didn't get enough support from the record label. That's often the cause of, of failure for even some, even some quite, you know, even huge bands run into this problem from time to time. But um, I don't know what happened. I, I suspect the record company didn't support them enough. They didn't get out there and tour enough for one reason or another. It probably wasn't their fault at all. You know, it's probably just down to either weird management, weird record label, not enough tour support. You know all these kind of things um the album was 
received a bit lukewarm with the record label. They weren't that bothered particularly about it. I don't think that this was a high priority band for them at the time. Um, although it should have worked out better, I think. I, who was who was was it? Walter O'Brien managing them, or was it? I think it was, wasn't it? But, um, so I don't know. You never know what the problem. You know, you never know why something doesn't work you know it's easy to say why it does work but for every for everyone that was a big hit in those days there's there's probably 10 other 20 records max 20, when, so, 50, when, 50. when something works everybody wants to take credit when nothing works nobody every it's crickets right nobody got, yeah it, right? you know and there's a there's a lot of reasons why things don't come together the stars don't align you know and that sort of thing yeah. but i mean steve as 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 you guys are saying i mean what a what a hero and and just kept going and that's what he wanted to do and um i mentioned nick you know nick menza earlier on and he kind of went out the same way if you like you know doing what he wanted to do and and you know it didn't it didn't uh, compromise on anything and uh it's very sad now to hear you know how uh, how steve was going through a lot of uh, a lot of pain and a lot of anguish and I, I never realized, and people never realized, because he didn't show it, you know, he just showed that brave face. So good for Steve. Well done. Todd, would, would you say, and, and I, I would you say, and this is to Alan, what he was mentioning, that Steve's voice was like on the level of, you know, like your voice and the top voices out there, like the plants and, and the Dio's. I mean, his voice, if you just isolate just his voice, that is how good he was. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm sure, I, I'm sure if if Max was behind the console and he started soloing out stuff and just put on his vocals, we would get to hear the magic that he got to hear when he recorded him. Um, but sure. the people that look, a guy like I said, he's earlier, an A list singer. That's what I'm trying to say. He, he's he, an he, A list singer. He's an A list singer. Sure, A list A A A list singer. Okay. Um, He's hitting notes, not that not that high notes means everything, but he was hitting higher notes than Bruce Dickinson was ever hitting in Iron Maiden. Um, and he had amazing vibrato. And but again, he didn't just sound like this thin tenor singer that hit these high notes. He he had a this almost like when the larynx drops, there's a it, again, he had a rounder a bottom end to to that range. You know, there are singers like Dio that actually are singing much higher than you would think he is because he had such a such a round, full, warm, bottom ending sounded voice. But when you really start playing those notes on the piano or you try to sing that note, you're like, wow, that's really high. So if you took a singer like, um, you know, uh, Tony Harnell or, you know, somebody that has that thinner sounding voice on the, on the singing side. Um, and you had him sing a Dio song. It would, it would be perceived that he was singing it higher than it, than Dio did, even though he's not Steve had an A-list voice. And the, the, the thing is the people that know, know, you know, what Max is talking about, you know, the question of, you know, why, why aren't they, more look there's some prodigy there's some amazing person playing in a train station or a subway yeah. station right now that is um, you know at that level or greater and nobody's ever gonna know and it's just a matter of luck timing all of these right things that you could have the best voice you could be the best guitarist drummer it doesn't matter what if you don't have proper representation and not only that, if you don't have the suits that are, you know, you know, if they don't see that this is what's what's hip right now and this is what's going on, maybe they're not going to going to put, put that kind of support that Max was talking about. I mean, these bands that are as huge as they are in the genres that they are without the mainstream Iron Maiden wasn't was a huge commercial band. I mean, OK, Run to the Hills was on some abstract video channels sometimes, but other than that, they weren't like this big radio band you heard all the time. Metallica was the same thing. These are anomalies. And and don't let anyone think that, that, that that's some kind of, uh, 
measure or barometer of 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 talent because it it it's not it's it's like they're lucky in a in a in a field of grass dude those bands are like a couple blades of grass when there's so much amazing talent out there but again the people that know people that are really into metal that know they know we could all name names and and you know the average you know I, I like metal. I love metal. You, you could name names and they're like, I don't know who that, that is. But if you show them that, they're like, okay, wow, that's incredible. But, you know, that was a very, the the, the stuff that Max did and, the you know, See You in Hell and all those other uh, songs from that, those records, De- uh, Dead on Arrival, you know, all these other things. Um, those, those were, I mean, the, the Rocky to Hell and See You in Hell, these are like very anthemic you know, these are anthemic metal songs that just are killer. I still love hearing that stuff. Makes me feel good. And 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 it's so cool that, that you know, the music that he created out is going to, we all say it. when we do something, we're like, wow, we just made history. You know, this is going to outlive us. When I'm dead and gone, I hope that there's some teenager that, that I'm inspiring that will, it will live on. And, and Steve's voice will carry on and make people feel certain ways that he would never know about. And Millie's never going to know about. You're just going to hear some stories, but you know, there's, there's thousands of people that there's people that are listening to it right now. And you don't even realize. <laughs> well, that. well, actually Somebody's that's playing. true because I've seen some comments saying, you know what? I just put on, you know, uh, <laughs> The See You yeah. in Hell album, and I just discovered this great band. It's like okay, a little too late, but that's cool. But I mean, but I mean, it's not like they're just playing it because of this tragic event. There are people playing it in different agreed, countries. Agreed, and agreed. And so it's like, uh, oh, b- you know, by the way, by the way, Todd Oliver from Keep It True says hi, guys. Nice to yeah. see you. So Oliver Weinstein from Oliver. Okay. If there's yeah. any questions <clears throat> that anybody would like to ask anybody here, please. Feel free to text. I also, have a want to, I, for Millie. I, I just want to say one thing. I just want to remind everybody that in the link of this video description, there's a GoFundMe for the funeral to send Steve off with a great funeral. It's going to be live streaming. We'll know more about that soon. But if you want to send any money, it's greatly appreciated. Steve, you know, he wasn't the richest guy. He didn't have the biggest, you know, um, he didn't have any insurance like big corporations, you know, employees do. He was just a struggling musician or, you know, uh, you know, uh, he did what he could and he lived, you know, within his means. And uh, it would. And again, it wasn't nobody asked me to do this. I'm doing this. Me and Alan are saying this behind for the metal voice that if you please, you know, donate. This is nobody has coerced me to do this. And, I, and this I'd be happy to us. share that on my social stuff too, any way that I can help and. Absolutely. Make sure I'll, I'll make sure that I get the links or information. I can, I will definitely post that to my stuff too. Any way we can help. I did have a question. I don't know if you covered it and I, I feel like, I hope, it's not, I hope it's not out of line, but I know that you said that Millie, that there was a, the service would be, would be streamed. Where, where is the final resting place is a cemetery is a place near, near. I, could you tell me that again? Yeah. So, um, so I mean I don't know how well any of you know and it Max you probably know Tewksbury but um I don't know about anybody else but so Tewksbury's in Gloucester which is about an hour away from me beautiful okay. abbey and then there's um a cemetery there as well that Steve's brother's buried his ashes are there so he's gonna he's he'll be there but some of his 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 request was when we you talk about these things randomly don't you like oh what would your um, final song be at your funeral and where would you want to be buried or scattered he wants to be has some of his ashes scattered on an airfield of course because he was such he was mad about airplanes um so that will happen not far from here but yeah it'll be in Tewksbury is will be where is that his final ashes will actually be be um gotcha. buried okay. did, did he want and you know did he want any music to be played at, at his funeral like I, I would think he would that's why I'm asking Yes, yes, I am. I'm just planning the funeral at the moment and um, just writing the order of service. Um, people may not know that Steve was a, a man of faith. He was a Christian. Um, and actually, See You in Hell is actually about the temptation of Christ. And it is, um, he wrote it within 
five minutes. He was sat on the toilet one day, he tells me, <laughs> and he just came to mind and he wrote it and that was it. It was done. And of course, it's his biggest legacy. But um, yeah, I can't what you just asked me. But yeah, <laughs> I can't remember what the question was. But yeah, he's... Um, yeah, so funeral songs. The question was, is he going to play any songs? What, what kind of songs? Are there will be, there will. So um, Music, Steve's I mean. biggest inspiration was Elton John, believe it or not. And Elton John's the reason why Steve's, Steve's sung. And so there will be, when he comes in, there will be some Elton John played. Uh, when, there will be a Grim Reaper song played. Um, but then the other songs will be more contemporary sort of Christian music that he liked. Mm-hmm. Um there's going to be a little bit of a rocky twist in there. I found a really good version of a, a well-known Christian song, which everybody knows, regardless if you're of faith or not. And But I found a, a twist, one with a twist, which has got been redone and a bit of a rock to it. So, yeah, there's going to be, I want it to be a good celebration of life. Um, Steve wouldn't want it to be doom and gloom. <clears throat> and he'd want it to be a celebration and just to be remembered. So um, that's that's what I'm hoping will we will achieve. Yeah, I'm well, sure. I'm sure you will. And if I'm overstepping here, how dep- was he really depressed? Like again, like it was very difficult to read him because he was always happy and enthusiastic. At least when me and Alan talked to him, you know, it, it, mm. you don't see that side. Was he really upset? Was he really sad? There were times when he was very low. Um, he did. I know he opened up when he first opened up about having PTSD, I think 18 months, I think after he lost his leg, um, maybe two years, he did actually um, consider taking his own life a few times because he was just so low. We've got um, just outside, we live in a little suburb here and we've got a road. It's not a massively busy, it's not a busy road or anything. It's just through, we've got some little shops across the road cars coming and going quite regularly but it's not it's a 20 mile an hour area so it's not a fast road um and he was crossing the road once and he was at the side of the road and he thought if I just keep going in my wheelchair not stop and just let the next car hit me then it will all be over I you know Millie won't have to worry about me anymore and and all this kind of he thought what am I doing here my life isn't even worth living thankfully he didn't do that and he said just in that split second there was a voice in his head and said what about your family and your kids what about your wife and your kids and your grandchildren because he's got uh, five grandchildren as well and um and that's what stopped him and he come home and he said to me he was in pieces and he said this is what I was about to do I need I know I need help so the next day he was at the doctors and then he started his treatment on sort of medication and therapy and stuff but he had some really really dark times and yeah covid definitely didn't help mm. but 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 leading up to this point you had said that he he had been in good spirits mm-hmm. um so he, he I, I i'm guessing that the depression um had subsided to a safer degree Mm. And he had some optimism. He was excited about doing these sh- upcoming shows. Mm-hmm. And he so he wasn't like when he passed away, he wasn't this super depressed person. He was a happy. No, man. no, not at all. He was he was in a pretty apart from still mourning his brother, which he just sure. never got over. He well, yeah, he was in a pretty good place. He had his he he had learned to because he'd been through a few different sort of therapy sessions, most of them online because of COVID. Um but they really helped him because they helped him realize what his triggers were, um, helped see the signs of him slipping back into quite a deep depression. And um, he would open up more. I think when when he first opened up to everybody publicly about um, having PTSD, how he felt, considering taking his own life, um, that really helped him, actually. And I know there's a good old cliche, there's a an advert for... British Telecom from years and years and years ago, I don't know, 80s, 90s, and their tagline was always, it's good to talk. And we always say that quite a bit here in the UK of, you know, it's good to talk, but it really is. It's because it's sometimes when you say something out loud, it's not quite as bad as is in your head because you get in your head. Yeah. He suffered from terrible anxiety 
and um, would have anxiety attacks. So he just, but yeah, in the last few months, he was in, he was in a pretty good place and That's playing good with his hear. planes and he was planning <laughs> on, he loved his planes. He was planning on start learning to fly as well, um, where he, where he flies his planes, uh, remote control planes, um, is on a glider, a site where they fly gliders. Oh, and cool. because he was a member there, he could learn for like virtually for nothing for free. Um, and he could do it because it was primarily um, hand controls. So he would have been able to do it. So he was sort of starting the process to start doing that. And yeah, he was loving it. But things were starting to pick up. And I think because yeah, more gigs were starting to be booked. So yeah. he was in a happier place. So that meant that he was more driven. So that's why he then got on and thought, right, I got to write an album. And he was halfway through an album. And yeah, his, his, his current manager, who's only been his manager since I think May, April, May, he really drove Steve along. Ellerton was really, really good for Steve. But um, yeah, COVID definitely didn't didn't help, <laughs> didn't help at all. Which it didn't for a lot of musicians. It wasn't just Steve; it just didn't help. Yeah, yeah. You know. Well, I'm um, glad I'm glad that that he got the help. You know, there's a lot of people um, commit suicide, and um, you know, I'm glad that he had that experience where he opened up to you and and was in you know, crying or in pieces or whatever he was and said, I need help. That's, that's what you have to do. Yeah. So I'm glad, I'm glad that he did that. And I'm, I'm thankful that you were, that you were there by his side to, to help facilitate all that. So always be proud of yourself. Thank you. Is there anything that you want to say that you haven't said uh, to everybody? Uh, I guess you pretty much covered everything. Um, is this helping you? It, yeah, it, it helps me. I'm loving it that people are keeping their, keeping Steve's memory alive. And I just plead that people continue to keep his memory alive. Like Todd was saying, even long after I'm gone, you know, just, music's alive forever. People, people come and go, but especially now with live streaming and you've got the internet and things bat around till the end of time. And I just, yeah, I just want people to just to keep his memory alive and the music and just generally Reaper and all the other stuff that he did as well. Um, yeah. You know, it's interesting. I'll just going to pause you right there. The day before, uh, sorry, the day he passed the Holmes family or Kathy and Chris, they text me. Mm -hmm. We just talked to him yesterday. Yeah. It was it's so like, you knew it wasn't like cancer or anything like that. It was like, mm -hmm. Jimmy, what happened? They were the first people who texted me. Like as soon as it sort of went on the internet, you know, when, mm -hmm. And then we just talked to him yesterday. We just had a conversation with him. Like we were talking to him last night. What's going on here? And uh, I don't know. I, I didn't know what happened. So, You know, there it's a double-edged sword, I think, when someone, when someone passes away unexpectedly, like there was no preparation. Like mm -hmm. on the one hand, it's good because it was peaceful and asleep, right? Mm -hmm. Like we should, we should all hope that that's how we, we pass away at the same time you feel robbed because, you know, you, you didn't get, I mean, you don't want to see somebody suffer, but when somebody's like terminal or they're, you know, that it's, they're dying they're it's happening. You can prepare, you can kind of mentally yeah. in the best capacity that you can, you try to prepare for, for what's coming. You can, you know, cross those T's and dot those I's. You can say all the shit you never got to say. You can right the wrongs. You can say how much you love someone. You can kiss them a thousand times. You can do everything, you know, and, and but you don't want to see somebody suffer where you, even though you have this prep preparation time. But then again, you have, you know, you didn't get to say goodbye the way that it would have been otherwise. But you're also thankful that he wasn't suffering and he went to sleep and that was it. It was peaceful. It, it's gotta be tough to, to wrap your, to wrap your head around, you know, this, this, like this un it's like we have unfinished business, you know, like, like a frustration and a, a an anger, like really like wait, we couldn't just have one more, one more, just one more time, one more time. I wanted to say, you know, we always think about, well, there'll be tomorrow. I'll, I'll bring that up or I'll, 
I'll do yeah, that. You know, you know, someone said death is so permanent. Like you just, <laughs> you know, you, you can't believe, you know, you'll never see this person again, you know, and I think it's happened in all our lives, yeah. right. In one way or another. And it's, it sucks. It just yeah, really sucks. It sucks. Well, I don't want to overstay my welcome, but Millie, I, I, yeah. I, really, I really, my heart is with you and I, I very much care for, for what you're going through. And, and again, my sincere condolences and, you know, if, if there's anything I can do to help in any way you have my, you I mean, we've texted on our cell phones. You can call me, hit me up. Um, always be an open ear for you. Um, and any links that we can help spread around our socials in the community to, to raise money, whether mm -hmm. it's for, for personal things that need to be done at home or uh, funeral expenses, you just let us know and we will gladly do everything we can to try to help raise funds to to ease that burden. Thank you. Thanks, Todd. Okay. And I mean that sincerely. So I'm going to sign off. I'm going to let you guys say bye. Hang Max. on, just wait. We're all going to we're going to wrap okay. it all up here. Just hang up before Max, you... good good to see you. Um Alan, good to see I... you too, brother. Don't okay, don't knock man. off yet. Just wait up one minute. One minute. Okay. I'm just going to sign off for everybody. Max, do you have any uh, last words you'd like to say? No, I, you know, it, it was a big shock to me. I'm still kind of reeling about it. And I'm, I'm, uh, my heart goes out to Millie and, uh, and uh, his kids and, you know, Mark and everybody else. Uh, you know, uh, I, I just hope that you can uh, weather the storm. It's a, it's a blackness that doesn't go away, but time will, you know, probably make it a, a little less hard to, to bear. But uh, as uh, Todd says, we're all with you and, yeah, anything if you want to pass us links or anything we can do to 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 help you, uh, you know, with uh, with this with these bullshit expenses or whatever you need. So, you know, I'm just really really sorry, and it's uh, it's way too soon for for him to be gone. So, yeah, Alan. Hey, just know that he was loved, and we continue to be loved, and he's left quite a, a, a great uh, soundtrack to, to our lives, and we can all enjoy it for, for forever, like you said earlier. So, oh, now, Millie, you get the last words. You get the last words, Millie. Yeah, oh, I just want to say thank you again, and thank you to all of you guys as well. You've been so kind and just said some lovely things about Steve, and I really, really appreciate that. So thank, thanks for coming on here and sharing your memories as well and stuff. All right. The links are in the video, everybody. They're there. Have yourself a wonderful night and, uh, you know, rest in peace, Steve. That's all I can say. <laughs>